Hi, this is Lilin and thanks for having me on Imagine TV Network. So the Singapore Memory Project was started uh, sometime early this year and it's basically a collection um, of interesting memories of Singapore spanning from you know anywhere between 10 to 50 years ago. So it comprises of um, little interviews, uh, photos, and then uh, Tan Pin Pin and myself actually commissioned to do two videos uh, pertaining to anything that was important to us for our memory. So at that time, I was doing uh, research for my feature film, Singapore Cowboy, which was based on the life of Matthew Tan, um, who sang the hit song Singapore Cowboy from 1979. And um, so I pitched it to Singapore Memory Project and I said I'd like to do a documentary about Matthew because nobody's ever made a documentary about him before. Because I was writing the screenplay for Singapore Cowboy, which is a fictional account inspired by Matthew Tan's life, I wanted to make sure that I could do a documentary that was more truthful to his story. But because I was given a time limit, a Singapore Memory Project actually wanted me to make a five to eight minute clip. But when I started talking to Matthew, there were so many interesting things. I didn't know if I could compress it to something so tight. So I thought about it and I, I thought, why don't I just focus on the song itself, like how he got started writing the song Singapore Cowboy and how it became a hit. Um, and that all pertains to his trip going to Nashville and how he started uh, falling in love with country music. So I thought that would be a good starting point to actually use the song Singapore Cowboy as an anchor for the documentary. So, and I didn't want to call it Singapore Cowboy because my feature film was already called Singapore Cowboy, so I decided to call it Singapore Country, which I thought was pretty cool. Matthew's actually a very old friend of my father's. I've known him actually since I was a kid. Um, he used to come to my house and my dad and him used to play music and my dad actually used to dress up like a cowboy. <laughs> and I remember when I was young, my dad told me actually, oh, Matthew and him are actually the same. He's actually Matthew. So day he goes to work and at night, he's actually Matthew the Mandarin. And because I was a kid, I was like very confused. I was like, oh, okay. So my dad's actually had two people. But anyway, soon I figured out that he was obviously just pulling my leg. And then on my dad's 60th birthday, he had a country western theme party. And Matthew came to sing at the party and everybody dressed up as cowboys. There was line dancing. And I sat down and I talked to Matthew for the first time. Because even though he's my dad's friend, I never got a chance to really sit down and talk to him properly. So I sat down and he told me his life story. And I thought, this is so fascinating and decided, okay, like A, I was going to write a feature film inspired by his life and B, I want to do something like a documentary for him. He told me about his journey to Nashville and that really fascinated me. Like some Chinese man, you know, from the 70s, a Singapore Chinese man who was not from a rich family. He essentially was a kampong, grew up in a kampong. Um, you know, came from a humble home, was a self-taught musician, actually had the guts to go to Nashville to learn country music. As you know, country music is it's very white, you know. It's it's very specific to that only white people sing it. And there's even a few African Americans who sing, but very, very rarely. Like the first African American to sing country music and sing it well was Charlie Pride. And that was also um, I guess it was in the 60s. So for Matthew to go there, I mean, it takes a lot of guts, you know. It's like a, a, asking a white man to come and like join a Wayang troupe. You know, it's just so incongruous. So that really fascinated me. So I think that was the main inspiration, that he had the guts to go to Nashville to pursue his passion. Matthew, despite the fact that he's now my dad's age, which is, I guess he's in his mid-60s, he has boundless energy and enthusiasm. So whenever he talks about country music and he performs country music, there's, it's it's like just seeing a young man on stage, you know, his passion is, is it, it just like shines through. And I remember when we had to shoot the documentary, we made him sing Singapore Cowboy several times because we needed, we only shot one camera, so we needed different angles and every single time, it was like full 110% enthusiasm. When Matthew was a kid, um, he told me this story about how he went to his uncle's house and he turned on the radio and he heard this Hank Williams song and he started singing along and dancing to it even though he really didn't speak a lot of English at that time so it just goes to show you how music can transcend cultures and language and he said it just spoke to him the way the song was sung his voice and he said from there he knew that he would have this passion for country music 
One of my favourite memories is definitely listening to my dad and Matthew play music in the house and seeing Matthew perform when I was a kid. Actually, that was very thrilling. Another fun memory that I have was when I, I used to study in Singapore Chinese Girls School. I was there for 10 years and we used to be next to Centre Point in our old campus at Emerald Hill. And when I would go to Centre Point, I would see these kids known as CP kids, Centre Point kids. And they were really colourful and they used to stand at the fourth or the fifth floor of Centre Point and just like look really cool. And that was always something that really struck me when I was growing up and I kind of secretly wish I could dress like that instead of my like stupid uniform, you know? And that, that was, I think, one of the most visceral memories that I had. Bright stars and guitars I'm actually really interested to do a documentary about Centre Point Kids and I've spoken to the Singapore Memory Project people about it to actually look at Centre Point Kids and um, I mean obviously now they're like my age or older and talk to them and, and look at their photos and sort of relive that past with them because I think there's this misconception that a lot of mostly Centre Point Kids were delinquents yeah, and possibly, I mean, they were just a bit of, they were kind of rebels, right? But I remember when I was growing up, there was always this more negative connotation to being a centre point kid. But I really saw them as fashionistas, people that are really on the edge and just cooler than everyone else. Looking back at why, kind of uncovering their mystique and also kind of look at where they are at their lives now and how did that period of time as centre point kids you know, influence them or shape them today and do their children know that their parents were so cool? <laughs> like used to dress, you know, like, I don't know, Banana Rama or Culture Club and hang out in Centre Point and, you know. Singapore cowboy, so far from my home. Um, so I'm really hoping that more people can log on to the Singapore Memory Project portal and watch my documentary, Singapore Country. It was made with a lot of love. I think Matthew is such an extraordinary artist of Singapore. Just goes to show that Singaporeans are capable of not always walking the straight and narrow road and taking the off-beaten track and actually being successful in it. I think he's a real inspiration. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Love it.